What's going on everyone? Welcome back, Patrick here. And in this video, what we're gonna cover is the production possibilities curve. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the production possibilities frontier. Sometimes you'll see it referred to in short form. So you may see PPC, which stands for production possibilities curve. So whichever way your textbook or prof refers to it, that's what we're gonna be covering in this video. They all mean the same thing. So to show you how the production possibilities curve generally fits into what we're covering, remember we're still covering scarcity. And in the last couple of videos, what we did was we more specifically looked at how consumers face scarcity. And consumers, if you remember, they face scarcity with limited income. Because they only have so much income, there's only so many goods and services that they can consume. And we visually showed this limited income and the different trade-offs that consumers face, the different opportunity costs through something called a budget line. That was a visual way to represent this scarcity here. Well, now what we're gonna be doing is looking at the scarcity that producers face. If you remember, I've mentioned this, that producers face scarcity because they have limited resources. So there's only so many resources that they can use to produce goods and services. And this scarcity here, these trade-offs that producers are going to face, the opportunity costs are going to rep be visually represented through this production possibilities curve. So there's going to be, it's going to be similar, a similar process with the budget line and the production possibilities curve, but there's going to be a few differences. One of the bigger differences is that notice how this is a budget line, while this here is going to be a production possibilities curve. So this is going to be a line that's going to be a curve and that's going to account for some differences relating to the opportunity costs and stuff like that. But we'll get into more detail on that as the video goes on. One thing I want to mention is sometimes when they're talking about a production possibilities curve, instead of referring to this group as producers, a lot of times you'll see this group referred to as society. And throughout the video, I'll mention how society in general fits with this concept. So to give a more specific definition for a production possibilities curve, it's basically a visual representation of the combinations of two goods or services that can be produced with limited resources. And with the, uh, similar to the budget line, notice how it says two goods or services. And so there's actually going to be a general process to create this curve. First, you have to pick two goods or services to produce with your limited resources that maximize. What do producers want to maximize? They want to maximize profit. So let's say that you own a clothing store, an online clothing st uh, store. Let's say you have limited resources. There's actually four types of resources. We're gonna cover that in a future video. There's land, labor, capital, and uh, entrepreneurship as well. Let's say that you have a certain amount of workers. So let's say you have a certain amount of labor. Now, what can you use this labor for? Well, maybe, you want to produce some shoes, or maybe we'll produce some shirts. Maybe you could produce some pants for your store. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be a product that this labor is used for. You can maybe use this labor for marketing. Or maybe it could be used for sales, anything else, or uh, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So there's different things that this resource can be used for. Notice how it's actually, this list here is similar to the budget line where I had shoes, shirts, pants as well. But you're now on the other side. 
So with a budget line, you are consuming these things. Now you own the store and you're producing these things. So you've got to figure out how to allocate your resources to producing um, this stuff. And so the first step, pick two goods and services to produce that maximize profit. Let's say that you feel like this labor is going to be best used to right now produce shoes and shirts. Let's say that uh, you're in the early stages of creating this company and so you want to actually make the product first. And as time goes on, this can change. So as time goes on, as you have more and more product, maybe you want to allocate more labor towards marketing or towards sales that's going to maximize profit. So this can always change with time. It could also change depending on the type of store you're running. So let's say maybe you're running a drop shipping store. Drop shipping just means that you, once you receive an order, then you go to a producer and get the inventory. So maybe in that case, you wouldn't be spending your time here. You'd be spending more time on marketing and sales. So the type of store um, can affect where you allocate your resources. But for now, let's just say that shoes and shirts is the uh, best way to allocate this labor. Once you have those two goods and services, what you got to do is you have to find the combination of these two choices here that maximize profit. So you have to find some kind of optimal allocation. And later on in the course, we're going to get into more detail on how you find that optimal allocation, that optimal combination. Just as a heads up, it's going to be, it's going to deal with uh, marginal benefits and marginal costs. Basically, when your marginal benefits equal your marginal costs. But again, we'll go into more detail on that in a later section. In this section, we're more so going to focus on how to make the curve and analyze the curve, analyze the different opportunity costs that might be faced with the two goods and services that you are producing. Now, with uh, these types of questions, dealing with a production possibilities curve, you're usually not going to have to do this step. Number one, you won't have to worry about it. Those two goods and services will, will already be given to you. And you're just going to have to focus on this here. Not really finding the combination yet, but representing it with that curve, right? So once you have those two goods and services, those two get put on that production possibilities curve. That's how we represent, visually represent the uh, scarcity that producers are facing. So let's show how all this works through an example. Let's say that you own a car manufacturing company and can produce two types of cars, sports cars and SUVs with your resources, with your limited resources. And your production possibilities are given over here. So one possibility is that you can produce zero SUVs and 50 sports cars. Or another possibility is you could produce 20 SUVs, 48 sports cars, 40, 44, et cetera, et cetera. Now, notice that one of the differences between this question and the budget line example that we did in the previous videos is that here this table is already given versus in the budget line example, we had to create the table. And the reason why is because notice that the opportunity costs are changing as we move to each possibility versus with the budget line, they were always constant. It's why we got a line, right? Because that opportunity cost was always constant. It was just a, um, the opportunity cost was the slope uh, of the line. And so to do those calculations was a lot easier. But notice here, if we move from possibility A to B, for example, in order to produce 20 more SUVs, what do we have to give up? What's the opportunity cost going to be? Well, we got to produce two less cars, two less sports cars. 
And then notice that as we go from B to C, to produce 20 more SUVs, so from 20 to 40, what do we have to give up? Notice we have to produce four less sports cars. So not two less sports cars, but four less sports cars as we move from B to C. And then as we move from C to D, it's going to be different again. And so that opportunity cost is always changing. Hence why it's, uh, it's tougher to do those calculations and create this table yourself. And notice that as we move from possibility, from one possibility to the next, notice that the opportunity cost is actually increasing. So here the opportunity cost was two sports cars, but here the opportunity cost is four sports cars. And there's actually a reason for that. It's called the law of increasing opportunity cost, but we're gonna cover that in a little bit more detail later on in the example. But yeah, for now, I just wanted to bring this to your attention about how that opportunity cost is always changing from one possibility to the next. It's not constant like it was for the budget line, hence why that table is, uh, is tougher to make. Now, it is actually possible to get more detailed information about a question like this and then make this table, but you'd have to have a lot more details on how that opportunity costs the relationship of that uh, increase in opportunity cost. So notice that here, from here to here, it's two. The difference is two. Here, it's four. And then over here it's eight. There would have to be some kind of pattern here and that pattern would have to be given to you. Kind of like in um, high school math, if you remember when you were finding like first differences and if they were constant, it was a linear function and second differences, if that was constant, it was a quadratic. So you'd have to be given that kind of detail. But again, we're not gonna be covering that kind of detail in, uh, in this video. So in this section, in this chapter, you're gonna be given this table when you're asked to make this production possibilities curve. And so visually, how this is gonna look is like this here. So notice how this number of SUVs I put in the x-axis and then the number of cars, number of sports cars, I put in the y-axis. Now it doesn't matter which axis you put it in, right? We could have put the number of SUVs here, number of cars over here but I just decided to go with this combination. And notice that I plotted all these points. So notice that this here is point A. So this point represents zero SUVs being made and then 50 cars being made. And then this is point B. That is uh, 20 SUVs being made and 48 cars being made. This here is point C, point D, point E, and then down here is point F. Now notice that when we connect these, what's gonna happen is it's gonna make the shape of a curve. Notice that it's not gonna be a line like it was when we did the budget line. It's a curve over here. It's always gonna look like this. Even if you switch these up, if you put the number of cars here, number of SUVs up here and plot it, it would still have this sort of shape. Now, with um, very similar to a budget line, this area inside the curve here is called the attainable area. And so what this means is that any combination here with your limited resources as a producer you can produce this combination. So you can produce, for example, 40 SUVs and 10 cars. Because if you're producing, if you're being fully efficient, if you're producing 40 SUVs, you're capable of producing 44 cars. So just by deductive logic, producing 10 cars while you're producing 40 SUVs is going to be attainable versus everything out here is unattainable. Now, as a producer, you want to be somewhere along this curve over here, one of these possibilities, because it then means that your resources are being fully used. They're being used most efficiently. If you're somewhere here, 
then you have some resources that are not being used, right? So you want to move yourself to be somewhere on this curve. And as I mentioned in future videos, what we're going to be doing is actually finding out which combination is the best. We're not going to be talking about that in this video, but there's going to be a way to find out which combination is the best, which combination is going to maximize the profit for the producer. It's going to be the optimal allocation. And again, it's going to be when your marginal benefits equal your marginal costs. But we'll get into more detail on that in a future video. One more thing I want to mention with this attainable versus unattainable area is sometimes you might be looking at a curve in different scales. So notice here that we are looking at your car manufacturing company. But I mentioned at the beginning of the video, sometimes instead of the word producer, you'll see textbooks refer to society when talking about this curve here. So you can look at it on different scales. So if we were looking at this from a society point of view, so a little bit more scaled out. And society has different resources. Let's say that one of the resources we're looking at is employment of all of society's members. Well, if we're looking at employment for society, and let's say that society is operating over here, right? So it's not operating most efficiently with all of its members. What that means is that there's going to be some kind of unemployment in society not everyone is going to be employed. Versus if society is operating on the curve here, when you're looking at that resource of employment, it means that on the curve there's going to be full employment. And then we could take it another step further and figure out what's the best uh, combination of employment. What should everyone specialize in in order for society to get the maximum benefit, to get the maximum output? Okay, so this curve can be looked at on different scales. So thought I would mention that as well. And it's why sometimes you'll see society being referred to in, uh, in textbooks when, uh, when they're discussing the production possibilities curve. Another thing I want to mention is that this curve can be affected by different things. And we're going to cover that in, uh, later on in this same video, in this same example. Right? It could shift this way or it could shift outward, very similar to how a budget line was affected with certain factors.